might get out a little bit early, but probably not. Yeah. Well, if we do, it'll be like an hour. <laughs> Working for the government or the courts, they only give you the one day off usually. That's that's kind of funny. That's uh, I work for government too, local government. I think we're both the technology department, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's what do you uh, what do you do again? Uh, I'm the I'm the IT director for the city here. Oh okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. I work in IT also. Yep. All right, we're live on YouTube, recording, and I'm going to put this in the group now. find it easier to follow the questions in uh, YouTube or on the on the actual meeting link? Uh, they're a little bit behind on Facebook. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Of, I think I was following the YouTube ones last time because it was easier. Yeah, I'm going to jump on it. Oh, yeah, I see it. I'll go to your, ch your channel there and do it that way. Okay. Just send it to... Hold on a second. Let me make sure I'm actually. We might get out a little bit early, but probably. All right, there we go. All right, so we're live on YouTube, and I'll jump into the group. Make sure. See if we can see some numbers here too. All right, there we go. We got people coming in now. <laughs> okay, good. It's on the group now too. Yep, see it there. <clears throat> All right, perfect. Let's just jump right into it then. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so thank you for uh, jumping in here. I know we planned this one a little while ago, but uh, yeah, with things going on and then vacation and you just, <laughs> I mean, life in general kind of threw monkey wrenches and everything. Uh, Yep. <clears throat> so again, uh, yeah, I think most people, I think a lot of people will be joining in, but just in case people don't know, uh, tell them who you are, what you do, and uh, and of course the channel name. Uh, yeah, my name's Wade Thomas. I'm the owner of Black Tie Bar and Candle Company. I feel like I'm doing an introduction for my channel yeah. right now on a video, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I run that Black Tie Bar and Candle Company, and then I've been kind of helping other candle makers for for quite a while now and then uh just kind of jumped on the bandwagon here and started uh started the youtube channel not too long ago just a few months ago and that channel is also black tie barn candle company so uh sorry hold on one second my speaker's just shot <laughs> i can't hear a thing <laughs> all right i don't know if that's I think we're good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I got you now. Sorry about that. Can you, uh, can you repeat that? Cause it shot out like as soon as you started talking. Yeah, no problem. Uh, just again, my name is Wade Thomas. I think I would probably talk with most of you before either on the channel or through Facebook groups and forums or whatever, but, uh, yeah, I'm the owner of black tie barn candle company. Um, and then also the YouTube channel, which is by the same name, uh, youtube.com slash black tie barn. Um, we'll try to, We'll try to post all of our channels and social accounts once uh, once we post the recorded video, I imagine. So Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's where you can find me and on Facebook as well, obviously. So, yeah, perfect. And uh, I know you do uh, candles still part time, just like me, right? Yeah, well, it, it, it was part time there for a while. It, it kind of started as part time and then you kind of know how, how it goes. It kind of gets so big sometimes so quickly that you just before you know it, it's a full time gig and you've got. Oh, some yeah, help. Absolutely. Kind of the kind of the same pattern, I think, for for a lot of us. But uh, yeah, I, I did not intend to start a candle business. <laughs> ago. it just kind of happened, and then it took off from there. But uh, you said how uh, long ago? Well, I've been in business uh, for almost ten years now. My current company, Black Tie Barn, I've only had established for six years. But I was doing some private labeling and some wholesale before that, um, and then I've been making for about. 10 to 12 years total. So, Oh, okay. Nice. But yeah, really, really hit it hard for the past probably six to eight years. Okay. So, yeah. That's really, I know, nice. And I know that, 
I know that everyone knows who you are, especially with this Facebook group and your channel, and that's where it's streaming to. But, but just in case, you know, there's some people here that maybe don't know who you are from my ch- any of my channels or Facebook or Instagram or something. If you want to do your quick introduction as well. Yeah, my, my name is Jeff Stanley. I make candles also uh, and run the YouTube channel Stanley Handcrafted. I've been doing candles for probably, I don't know, a little over five years now, going on six years. And uh, yeah, I think kind of the same as you, I was going to ask you about your channel. But uh, I know for me, when I first got into it, uh, even just three, four years ago, there really wasn't a ton of information out there. You really had to dig deep. Uh, and the YouTube videos that were out there were kind of few and far between. And one of the main ones that I watched and uh, kind of learned a little bit from was real vague on some of the stuff that they were doing. And uh, I I definitely don't want to throw them under the bus or I would mention their channel. Uh, They just had a one-off video and talked about doing candles. And they even mentioned in the video, I'm not going to tell you exactly how I do this because I don't want you to eat into my business. So I was like, all right, well, there's clearly a lane that needs to be filled here. And then so I just kind of started documenting my process and uh, kind of learning as I go. And uh, it honestly just watched the video and I was like, okay, well, I could at least put a better video out there that gives people a little bit more information. And then right. it just started growing from there. And then of course, making candles growing alongside uh, the channel. Uh, they both just kind of grew together, which is great. Yeah, no, you're right. There several <clears throat> years ago, there wasn't, there wasn't much out there. In fact, I think your channel is one of the first ones that I saw any kind of consistent content coming out at all. And I mean, I, I think you just kind of, jumped on the bus at the right time, or well, that's probably the wrong way of saying it. I think you started driving the bus at the right time because there wasn't really a bus to jump on at that point. Yeah. And I'm partially to blame for the, for the same thing. Cause like I said, I've been, I've been kind of helping off and on in different, different ways. Sometimes just live uh, groups and classes or uh, kind of one-on-one zoom meetings, these type of things. Uh, yeah. And it never, it never dawned on me to do a YouTube channel until uh, six months. Well, about a couple, about a year ago. And then I was, yeah, took me forever to get around to it. But yeah, that's, it was definitely a lot of vague, not, not a lot of ton of helpful information out there. So there was definitely a gap to fill there. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I thought the same thing as soon as I saw that gap in the market, I was just like, well, I mean, even if it doesn't do anything, and I never really intended for the YouTube channel to like grow into what it has become. Uh, but for me, I just, I love photography. I love doing videos. Uh, back when I was in high school, middle school, me and my buddies always made movies and cut them together. So it, I just like working in Photoshop and Premiere and editing videos. So it was like, all right, well, it's an excuse to do that kind of stuff too. So I jumped in and started doing that. And then of course the, uh, I think it was the third video I made, which was the how to make candles one. That one started to really take off. So I was like, all right, well, I mean, obviously there's people there that want to see this stuff. So I just started doing everything and just talking about everything that I was doing. Well, it makes, makes it a lot easier. It was hard to get started in this because yeah. just, just uh, relying on suppliers to give you information and manufacturers to give you information. They're only going to give you limited info to go yeah. off of. And you really need to hear from other people who make candles. And, and it was tough to get started, uh, you know, a handful of years ago. So luckily between groups and channels and other, other avenues. It's a lot easier for people to get started these days. And it was good timing. Oh, yeah. 2020, people looking for something else, time to fill, money to make. This was, it was good. It's good that that happened before this year. Yeah, hit. absolutely. And I think the kind of candle industry, I mean, it's always been really big, of course, but it's, it's been kind of uh, not really underground, but definitely kind of a subsection of things. And uh, with everything jumping off, especially with people, like you just said, from home making more money, definitely gotten a lot bigger. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah. And then, uh, well, do you use? I think I, I think I already know. Or if if you have like a proprietary blend or anything like that, don't say. But <laughs> for those wondering, what uh, what's your kind of go to? Well, um, you know, I've been kind of showing some of my go tos, and and really the last month's worth of videos. I I really use three waxes for candles, my container candles. Um, almost exclusively at this point. Um, and I'd say it's about a third split between all three of them. So uh, I've been using 6006 the longest um, for all the reasons you've always talked about, overall balance yeah. and everything, performance, it's just really <laughs> reliable. Um, and so I've used that for the longest time and about a third of my current candles, I use that. Another third is something I've really only been using for about two years, but it's it's quickly become maybe my favorite just because of how easy it is to work with. And that is uh, your ProBlend 600, which is very similar to your to your uh, 
your joy wax type of blend about a 50 50 split there okay and then i use another one from a company called claris i'm not sure if you're familiar with them but uh, they're out of uh, north carolina and texas and they have a product called claris 3022 and it's the opposite of 6006 it's a uh, 70 par- uh, soy and 30 percent paraffin oh really okay and it's by far the the, the best throwing yeah. soy or heavy, heavy soy blend that i've ever used it can be tricky to work with uh it it does shrink quite a bit and contract. And so you got to really <laughs> dial in the process and your, and fine tune your, your whole process, but holds color, holds fragrance, hot throw is amazing. The port, the, oh, uh, the, yeah, the, the melt point's really good too. So it, it holds up during summer. So that's pretty good. Yeah. That's always a tough one to try to find a wax that you can actually ship during the summertime. That's not going to be a melted, like slanting mess in a jar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The exactly. pro blend is one I've wanted to try for a while. And I've had a lot of people tell me they really like it. Uh, I need to hurry up and get some so I can actually see what it's like. But the other one, I, I haven't even heard of that one. Yeah. You know, the pro blend, it, it can be, it can be somewhat picky on fragrances just because the 50% soy content. So it doesn't work in necessarily every candle that I've, or every fragrance I want to use, but um, it, it, a good majority of them. So, the, you know, just the key is testing like oh yeah, all the time and nothing for me has quite reached the overall performance of 6,006 reliably. I mean, it's hard to throw yeah. a fragrance at 6,006 and not get good results. I know. I've always had great luck with it. And it's just so easy to work. I mean, the sinkholes are kind of a pain in the ass, but it's so easy to get around those. And uh, I mean, not easy to get around them, but <laughs> I mean, I'll, take, I'll take the good with the bad. Yeah, exactly. I'll take good yeah. hot throat. And other than having like a, a 24 candle batch of soy that is barely throwing. I mean, that's yeah, just. They all got pros and cons. So it just got to pick oh, your yeah. battle. You know, I'd put together this, this, uh, kind of tool that I built spreadsheet tool that I posted my channel a couple months ago that kind of uh, lets, it lets all the candle makers choose kind of weight, what factors are most important to them. And then oh, nice. based off of that, then you can see kind of what waxes you, you might interest you. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, if it, it's, if you care the most about hot throw, I mean, a, a few <laughs> of them jump to the top for sure. So, yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, hot throw is definitely my number one, but if I was going to go based off of that, I would probably lean towards the 4627 and that <laughs> stuff is just, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it is. There's still, it like, can also be a little messy to work with. So. Well, that's what I'm saying is, yeah, I mean, the hot throw is incredible, but that stuff is just such a nightmare to work with. I think the last bag of that I got, I went through the entire thing and it's so messy. There was probably still two pounds of wax in the in the bag that I just couldn't get out, or I wasn't even going to bother with it because it was it's such a nightmare. Yeah, you no. just talk it. <laughs> no, yeah. it's a and big then, uh, gasoline, That's all it is. Oh yeah, it's crazy. And then have you tried any of the uh, coconut soys? So I've been getting that question from a lot of the viewers here recently on the channel. Okay. Uh, I've tested them. I don't use any in my line. Um, they're all right for me, but so far they haven't they haven't matched um, either the the ProBlend 400 or the 6006. Yeah. Uh, I just need to do more testing with them. I haven't used them quite a bit, or, you know, so. It's been pretty good so far. I'm starting to, those are definitely becoming like my a second favorite for sure. Uh, I've only tested the, uh, I just did the A05 from Luxury Candle Supplies. Of course, you can't get it here. Uh, right. But yeah, I tested that one. It worked out really good. I've got a cinnamon one burning and testing in the, the other room right now. And then the uh, the wooden wicks coconut soy, and then I think the is it California Candle Supply? I know they have a coconut. Or they do yeah, the, the coconut eighty three. Eighty three, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a cocoa soy blend. I'll have to look that up. I might be wrong on that, but I know somebody else carries a, the cocoa soy, and it's been really good for me. Yeah, that that coconut eighty three you're talking about from Cal Candle Supply is. They, they pretty much label it as a complete candle or a complete coconut wax, but it does have some vegetable waxes as a stabilizer, but it's mostly coconut yeah. from what I understand. So. Yeah, I know Erica from Memory Box Candle uh, uses that one. I'm pretty sure she uses that exclusively and she likes it quite a bit. I need to try some of that. Yeah, I don't know how well it'll work for me unless I can find it more locally because it'd be shipping for California and I'm, I'm here in Kansas yeah. City, so... Yeah, it's definitely a little tough to get some of those things from across the way, <laughs> clear across the United States. Yep. Shipping becomes a huge factor, and it's like, all right, I'll kind of hold off on that one for a little bit. <laughs> unless, unless you're buying a pallet, it can be well. Yeah, good. exactly. Then it, it, yeah, then it's more cost effective. Yeah, going to flip through these comments here, and we'll see what uh, see what people are saying. Uh, Amy just started my candle business in September. Congratulations! Good time to try it. <laughs> of course, you jumped right in when everything Perfect. is out of stock. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> makes it real tough to get supplies right now, but. <laughs> You got to start somewhere. 
Yeah. And there's a there's Sissy and Kevin. That's appreciate the nice comments there. Let's see here. We got uh, Chris. Uh, hey guys, thanks for the help. I have a question about getting good cold throw with C6 and 464, but hot throw is lacking. Um, be more specific about formulas. Would love to hear your thoughts. Now the C6, um, gosh, let me look that one. I know I've used that one before. Is that the, is that the paraffin soy blend? The C6, uh, is that the one they're getting from, um, I see C6 come from uh, Lone Star. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, I Lone think Star. A, I think it's a soy coconut. Yeah, I, I just put uh, up coconut soy. I haven't actually used that one, but uh, uh, like I was just saying, with the uh, the other two coconut soy blends that I've been trying, I've been getting really good cold throw and hot throw with those. Um, gosh, I have it sitting over here, but the uh, the cold throw from the A05, I've got one sitting over here, and I can smell it from here. It's great. The hot throw has been pretty good. And I know for me, I've been using right at 8% with that one. Yeah. I mean, just to kind of follow up on that a little bit, uh, Chris, <laughs> your question is, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of the coconut in those is coconut to me, at least has performed a little bit more reliable. It's kind of like paraffin. It, it just, it's pretty consistent with how it performs. Um, whereas soy can be very, polarizing and inconsistent some batches were great otherwise you know other batches not so much and coconut just seems to kind of almost stabilize it a little bit um and then but as far as like cold throw versus hot throw both c6 and 464 are so soft the, generally mm -hmm. speaking the softer your wax uh you're gonna get better cold throw because it's already in a soft state and so the fragrance is easier to just kind of fill the air um but that's also that's also usually a symptom of, of candles uh, that have harder time with hot throw. Um, I don't know your feelings on 464, Jeff. I know you've done some videos on it. It's not one of my favorite waxes and yeah. I'm, not, I'm pretty, I'm pretty transparent about that, but yeah. it, it just requires so much time and maintenance and testing just to even find oils that work well for a good hot yeah. throw. Well, and you can definitely do it, but. Yeah. And my thoughts exactly on that one. And it's, it's hard to like 6,006. I know I can get a new box of it every once in a while. I think somebody was having issues with the last couple of batches of uh, 6,006. It was a little bit uh, different consistency, but I was still getting hot, uh, good hot throw from it. But the 464 can go through batches where you just don't get any hot throw at all. So uh, I've definitely had really nice soy candles come out of batches where they threw extremely well, but I definitely don't trust that going from box to box. You almost have to test every single one just to make sure that you're still getting consistency. Yeah. That's in fact, that reliability. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, any kind of inconsistent type of waxes. So your, your heavy soy waxes, I tend to just want to cut them with something that I know yeah. is reliable and stable. You can mix it with 6,006. You can mix it with coconut. That's why coconut soy is getting so popular is it helps kind of stabilize that wax and make it. Yeah. Definitely. Reliable. So, yeah. It's kind of, it's a nice wax to have on your label too, because people see soy and coconut wax and yeah, just, it sounds nice too. It does. Yep. Let's see. Uh, what else we got here? It's like, um, Mrs. Mrs. K Henry started hers back in January. So luckily she was able to get started while you could still get some supplies. <laughs> Um, and actually she asked, um, I'm kind of jumping a little bit for a sec here, but, uh, she had also asked if, if we have any plans to use eco soy again, now that it's coming back to the market. Um, I don't know about you, Jeff. I, uh, I've reached out to them a little bit and, you know, with them being overseas, sometimes it can be harder and take longer for them to get their products over here. So I have not really considered it yet. I've reached out to them, but that's pretty much the extent so far for me. Same here. I'll probably get a, bo a, a box of it to test when it comes in. Um, I know uh, Ariana Arsenal. Uh, she uses it. Yeah, she uses it a lot. And she's actually really excited. I was just talking to her last week. Very excited to be getting it back in. She loves it. Um, yeah. I haven't used it enough to give any thoughts or opinions on it. I definitely want to try it. I, I had used it previously before they went out of business um, and re re they were bought out and I liked okay. it all right. I liked it better than 464 for sure. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, okay. But, but then they started experimenting with those quantum waxes, which were a complete nightmare. 
Uh, yeah. And then, uh, then they went under. And now that they're rebounds, you know, bought back out, well, who knows? Maybe we've got some good news on the horizon. And, um, like you said, anyone else that has questions about that wax, though, um, I'll, I'll try to remember when I post the recorded to my channel as well to post a link to Ariana's because she does use that wax and she, and she loves it. So she'd be oh, yeah. resource on that probably. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, it was it Tony said, I'm finding the max uh, FO percentage fragrance oil, uh, oil percentage for 6006 for better hot throws are on 8%. What are your thoughts? That's exactly what I use is 8%. Yeah, I use really anywhere from six to nine percent, but I start usually eight percent and then I adjust from there. If it's a little weaker, yeah. I'll go up to nine. But some some scents are so punchy in the face that I go down to six percent. So, yeah, there's definitely a couple strong ones. I know every time I use like 11 and 12 percent, it would either uh, well, 12 percent. You usually see some not 12 percent. Sorry. 12% uh, is definitely too much for it, but like 10 and 11 percent, even at 10 percent. A lot of times I was getting sweating across the top of the candle and and even at like uh, heavy oils at 9%, I just wasn't getting that good a hot throw from it. I mean, it was nice, but I bumped it back down to like seven and eight and it was much better. Yeah. I don't notice any improvements adding more oil, usually just more wicking issues, if anything. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like the oil just kind of clogs up that wick and it just doesn't know what to do with that much oil and the wax and it, it doesn't burn both evenly. Yeah. So Ga Gabriella Edwards asks, what's a good beginner friendly wax? And should you necessarily stick with that for the life of your candle business? Well, I know we both have done videos on reviewing several different waxes. Um, I have one where I actually compare five common beginner waxes. Um, if you want to check that out. And I know uh, Jeff has done uh, specific videos on each of those waxes as well. I would say, honestly, um, you know, it kind of depends if, if you're, if you care about paraffin versus soy versus coconut, you kind of need to answer that question first. But if, if not, I mean, it's hard to go wrong with 6006 is a good wax. It's easy to find anywhere. There's a lot of information and people out there that use it so they can help you, uh, which is a good, to me, that's one of the best waxes to use because you can get a lot of help. There's a lot of resources out there. I was going to say the exact same thing. 6006, I think I made a video about it too. It's definitely the wax I recommend to all beginners just because it's so easy to work with. And it's very forgiving in the beginning. Like soy, if you don't nail soy candles, uh, which I mean, I've been working with soy for a couple of years now, and there are times when I don't nail it. Uh, so I, it can definitely be frustrating. That's why I tell people to kind of stay away from 464 at first, even though there are people that have great luck with it right out of the box. Uh, but 6006, you can add it at, you can add your oils at 190 degrees, 160 degrees, and you still get a great throw from it. So uh, the sinkholes being the least of my worries, it's definitely the easiest one to recommend. Yeah, and there's tips and tricks to deal with the issues with 6006, like sinkholes. There's things yeah. you can do. Um, you, you have far less problems, in my opinion, with 6006 as you do with some other ones. Problems that are correctable, too. Like, it's yeah. hard to correct waxes that have bad hot throw. I mean, you can't trick the wax into performing better, yeah. you know. Um, exactly. But the only other one I would throw in there with 6006 would be the, the ProBlend uh, 600. And okay. that is because it's even easier to work with in 6006. Um, you just don't get sinkholes. You get great jar adhesion, all the things that everyone cares about early on. Um, and it might not be quite up to par with 6006 on hot throw, but it's it's close. Um, it, it'll spoil you, though, because that wax is so easy is to use. I mean, it's... <laughs> I'm going to have to get some. A lot of people never turn back from it because it's so easy to use. Um, but to answer the second part of your question, Gabrielle, as far as should you stick with your first wax for the life of your candle business... I would just say it depends. If it works for you, uh, I wouldn't be in a hurry to change, but I can tell you from personal experience, I've, I've, well, I now use three to four different waxes on a regular basis, depending on the purpose. Um, but most candle makers start with the wax and then as they evolve, um, they either, they either change waxes eventually, or they at least start sampling others. You're always, you're always looking to fine tune your product. So, um, you know, just, it kind of, it's just kind of depend on how your business is transforming really. So. Yeah, I would definitely say try a few different waxes. That way you can just see kind of how they, it, it's nice to see how each wax performs. That way you have a better idea when people, especially customers come up and ask you questions. Uh, why is it doing this with frosting or the wet spots or anything like that? You'll, you'll know exactly why. And uh, just having just that real world experience. Uh, and like you said, it'll kind of nail down exactly what you want to do with your candles. And if you want to take it in a different direction too, because some people, the look of a finished candle between Soli 464 and 6006 are very different. Uh, and that kind of frosted, not really frosted look, but the uh, the kind of rougher top, I don't know how to, I, 
six thousand six looks like it has a clean sheen across the top of it, whereas four six four looks dry, um, and that may fit the kind of style and aesthetic that you're going for. So. I would definitely say once you kind of nail your candle, definitely, like you said, Wade, jump out, try get a five pound bag of a different wax and, and see what you think. Yeah, I think that's the key part right there. The key point is uh, don't overcommit yourself too much on the wax. So only buy enough to make sure you, you have enough to test with, but that you're not going in debt with the wax where you almost feel attached <laughs> to it. Like you, you can't like you don't want to put yourself in a position where you feel like you have to use this wax now because you bought so much of it. Yeah. Early on. Just just test and get comfortable. And then. Um, and then kind of and kind of decide from there. Uh, right after uh, Gabrielle's question, um, Monica, I think is is the username, asked if anyone has used the new HTPs. Well, um, they're not out yet for mass distribution, but I did post a video on my channel a couple weeks ago. I got my hand on some of the new ones that are being formulated or engineered, and uh, so far the testing is going well. I posted some early That's results. Cool. I'll be posting my second set of results here probably next week. Um, it's, it's good news. It's good news. I haven't found anything that even would require wick size changing so far. Um, it's, it's been, there's light at the end of the tunnel with HTPs. Now it's just a matter of how soon will they get them out for distribution to suppliers. Yeah. I've been checking in almost probably annoying them by now with how much I'm checking in on it, but, uh, uh, they're, they're on their way and testing has been good. So that's kind of all I can really say at this point. Cause yeah, I can't wait to test long. them. I've looked at a few sites. I've got so many HTPs that I haven't like really rushed out to get new ones. I do want to try them and get some testing done for videos. Uh, I know one lady in the group last time said that her company, I forgot what it is. And I apologize. Uh, she said that her company actually got some and I should have got some from her at the time off the, I think it might be in the last video that I did. Uh, but she said they had some, but all the other sites, like you said, uh, they're not even in yet. Uh, but I haven't been looking too much. I've been checking like Lone Star like once a week just to see. Yeah. Well, you know, there's it, it's all in who you know. I'm sure there's companies out there who have been able to get their hands on them. But oh, yeah. for the most part, they're, they haven't been mass distributed yet. So let's see here. I'll let you kind of grab the next one that you see here. Yeah, I was going to say there was one just above that that, let's see if I can find it. I thought I saw one. Where was it? <laughs> uh, I have a question reg or, uh, from Rebecca. I have a question regarding fragrance throw. Is it true that not all fragrances can work with the type of wax of your choice? Uh, or is the performance of the fragrance completely reliant on the type of wick? Uh, there are definitely oils that work better with certain waxes. Uh, now, you can definitely get a little bit of a, a hot throw from some of those, not bad oils, but some of those weaker oils with uh, kind of wicking. Wicking is going to come down to everything. But uh, yeah, if you go to Candle Science, they're a great website for looking for this exact type of thing. They have uh, like a rating system. It has little leaves on it that uh, will tell you which oils work better for like soy wax. And certain oils just don't work well at all in waxes. Well, and, and to, to add to the complexity, uh, not all soy is the same. Um, yeah. Every manufacturer makes soys in different ways. In fact, if everyone, everyone might remember, if you've been making candles for a few years now, that the soy industry took this big transformation a couple of years ago, where all of a sudden soy waxes were getting a lot of complaints and not performing well at all. And the reason was, is because some laws had been passed that changed the way that they the, the process they use for the hydrogenation of the oils of the wax. And it's all about how they're, uh, it's all about how they're creating and manufacturing these waxes and the fats that they use. And so that changed the soy industry quite a bit. In fact, that's why um, Eco Soya brands went under and they started experimenting with the quantum waxes. They were trying to find a replacement. Well, uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is just that every manufacturer makes soy. Some use off the shelf type soy wax that you can find anywhere. Others make it in house. <laughs> They're all made different ways. So even if you find an oil that you test in one soy wax and you find it doesn't work real well, don't be afraid to test in another one because they're all made yeah. differently. So, yeah, definitely. And certain, like you were saying, some uh, soy waxes, and I think a lot of them have changed it, but uh, there are certain ones and I forget the company, but certain ones that had like trace amounts of paraffin and palm in it, which definitely helped with hot throw. And I think some of those have removed those and gone towards more of a, uh, like a true clean soy All right, kind of a lot of questions here. I'm trying to 
Uh, Ray's in there. Uh, how far in advance do you plan for your fragrance collection releases with your candles? What's your planning for those? About how far out do you start looking? Um, as far as testing new ones, like if I'm going to add a new one to the candle line, I'll usually start uh, a season or two before. So if I'm going to roll out some new scents for Christmas or winter, um, I'll usually start testing those in spring. Um, okay. But as far as if I already kind of know what scents I'm going to roll out, I'm not developing a new one. I yeah. I'll start, I'll start making those, you know, a season in advance. But I kind of stock everything all year long. It's yeah. just I stock. I stock more at different times of the year, but, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, I think give yourself enough time to not only get your samples in and test the oils um, with your wax and, and make sure everything's locked in uh, with your process, but then enough room that you can uh, enough time available. You can still go out and order your supplies and then hope that there's no delays yeah. on them. So a couple seasons is, is what I do. Yeah. I know if, if I'm coming up into like spring, uh, it, we're still going through winter. So I'm still doing winter candles, fall candles, stuff like that, or those type of scents. Uh, but going into spring, I'll probably start doing those. Um, I don't know, a good, I like to have a good set of candles at least a month before the season kind of starts to kick off. If you're doing, and it's definitely a good, re, it, it's a good idea to have a stock like that. Uh, and if you're doing something like soy, I know the topic of curing comes up. Uh, if that is an issue, and if you do your candles a month, two months in advance, and you've got like 30 pumpkin spice and 30 apple spice, and they've been sitting on your shelf for a month. Uh, I mean, you're well past any curing that somebody would be care or somebody would care about. But yeah, I'd say it, it, it's good to start probably a good month before. And like Wade said, uh, definitely coming up into fall and winter, I would start those probably a little bit early. And coming right into September, October, like keep that stock building up because supplies start to run real short. Uh, even in a season when it's not COVID, <laughs> supplies are, I mean, there's a, the straight jars. I mean, they run out of lids by December every single year. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and not only that, but people, it's also our busier season. So not only are we going through more supplies, customers are buying more candles generally. So you want to have enough to be able to kick out candles pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Christina or Chris, Christine Zeller asked, uh, I have a question about why some fragrance makes 464 seep, even when I dial in the percentage. And then she gives a specific example of black sea. I mean, the short answer to that, um, from my experience, has just been the density of the oil that you're using. Um, heavier oils versus lighter oils. Um, the heavier oil, you're generally going to want to use a little bit less. It's going to want to separate and not bind as much with the wax. So um, that's another reason why I don't like the standard rule of thumb of max out your weight, or, uh, max out the, the fragrance in yeah. your wax. So 464 can hold 10 or 12 percent. I never max it out because you need to leave yourself some room for those oils that don't play as well. And you want to give yourself a little buffer. Yeah, I would agree. Something like uh, very vanilla is another really thick, uh, dense wax. And yeah. that's one where if you normally add 10% or 8%, I would go down like a, at least 1%, if not two. So if you're doing 9%, I would add it at seven. And then I, I would also tell you to check your temperatures. If you're adding them pretty low, like 150, 160, I would go ahead and bump that, especially that oil. If you have one that's like seeping, uh, bump it up a little bit more, add the oils at like 170, 180 or 190 and see if it does any better for you. Yep. I'm a big proponent of adding my oils hotter than a lot of the people are talking these days. Um, a lot, there's a lot of conversation these days of adding your oils at pretty low temps. I'm not a big fan of that myself. Um, yeah. there's just more, ri more risk than reward in that. It, so. Yeah. And I've got a low temp video that shows like my testing with that kind of stuff and I've had good luck with it, but if you don't do it right, yeah, you can absolutely have a mess of a candle and, okay. uh, it's it's one of those videos where I like people to know that it's a test, but I think people going into that video, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, you get a lot of people that uh, that think that's the proper way to do it, even though I state in the video, this is not manufacturer's suggested temps. Uh, but for me, I definitely add everything pretty hot as well. Yeah. My go-to is about 180 to 185, but that's just, you know, we're all a little bit different and we all work oh, yeah. in different environments too. So. Yeah, I'm right around like 175, 180, so it's almost the same. You know, I've seen I've seen a lot of comments in about some uh, 6006 since we brought it up. Um, some people having some issues with it lately, and they're they're not having the success they were hoping for, and some bad batches. You you touched on that. That's probably warrants a whole another video and conversation, so we don't kind of take up this whole video on that topic. But um, my short answer to that is 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 keep track of the lot numbers when you get these cases of wax, and ask your supplier. 
if there's any known issues with that lot. And depending where you got them from, sometimes they'll replace the lot if they suspect there could be an issue. Um, and then also, if you can cut your wax with something else, like if you're noticing that your 6006 is harder yeah. than normal, uh, maybe the melt point's a little higher, something like that. If you have anything softer on hand, coconut, so, uh, some soy, something like that, that can help balance it out a little bit. But I do, I do run one test as a baseline candle from every new lot that I buy. Um, and I did a video on baselining wax for that exact reason, because mm -hmm. the, the manufacturers and suppliers won't tell you this, but um, well, they will if you ask, but they don't volunteer it. <laughs> and that is uh, there's an acceptable level of variance in their waxes uh, oh, yeah. on each lot. So they can vary by a couple points on the congealing point, on the melt point, uh, all sorts of things, the density. And so as long as it falls in that acceptable threshold, they can still supply it. And it can be enough for us to still maybe change wick size by a size or two. So just kind of know that and, uh, you know, consider testing your new, new lots of wax every once in a while. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And we were talking about 4627 earlier. If, uh, if you've got a bad batch of wax, uh, especially 6006, since it already has paraffin in it, if you've got uh, some 4627, throw like a pound or two or, or like 10, 15 percent. Uh, and that will definitely help with hot throw there. It's going to make the candle a little bit softer, but uh, I mean, you can offset that too with a little bit of 4625, but I mean, not everybody's going to have four or five different waxes on hand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you do get a bad batch, like Wade said, definitely test like a candle or two right out of it. And then uh, if you know the, the batch is bad and it's just not throwing well, definitely get a mixer. Yep. And I've got it. It's been rare, but I've seen 6,006. I think I've gotten two boxes out of several years of buying boxes uh, that the consistency has been real noticeably different. Yeah. Yep. I've had a few of those as well, but yeah. yeah. You just cut into it and you're like, wow, this is much harder than it normally is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone asked about mixing 450, uh, I think it was 415 with 6,006. Um, and if it's something you can do, yeah, you could you can blend really any waxes you want together. Um, it's just about testing and, and making sure it's going to work to for the results that you're looking for. Um, when mixing waxes, it, again, it kind of depends on what you're going for. But most people start at like a 50 50 and then they adjust up and down from there. Yeah, that's exactly what I do, especially if I want to see what the wax is going to look like or uh, just it, the wax is harder. You want to make it softer. It's too soft. You want to make it harder. I usually start at 50-50 just to see what it does. And then if it goes one way that I didn't want it to, I'll just drop it back down and do like a 75-25. Yep. And I've got some of that 415. I haven't done any testing with it yet. So... Looks like uh, the sissy it's over asked how long you cure your candles. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the wax. You're, I mean, it not kind of, it really depends on the wax you're using. Um, you know, if I'm making 6,006 candles, by the time I've even got them out to the order to ship, that's good enough curing. Um, 6,006 doesn't need very long. And even yeah. for testing purposes, I wait a couple days at the most. Um, pretty much the higher the soy content, the longer I let it sit and cure. But for the most part, uh, by the time you've made your candles, you've set long enough, you've trimmed your wicks, you've labeled them, they sit on a shelf for a day or two, or you're packaged them off and send them off to your customer. By the time they get them and burning them, they're already cured. Uh, that's the yeah. way I look at it. So, Same here. And it, especially like you were saying with soy, the higher the soy content, I still do make some soy candles and I maybe let mine sit three to five days. And if I know I'm going to ship them, I might like you said, I'll ship them out on the second or third day. And then by the time they get to the customer, you're at six, seven, maybe eight days, depending on where they are. And it's more than enough cure time for me. Yep. Yep. And you know, one, one uh, piece of advice I would give on anyone using uh, waxes with a long cure time for as far as testing goes um, is if make, always make two candles, uh, a batch of two when you're going to test. And that the reason I do that is I'll let it, I'll do the first test a couple days, uh, you know, 20, 48 hours later. And then what I'll do is that other candle that I made, I will retest that one again in about two weeks to see if there's any noticeable difference. I have yeah. used some waxes that um, the hot throw wasn't necessarily different, but after the, the candle had time to settle and cure, I actually saw the wick size change a little bit. And oh, yeah. I had me concerned before. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I've had one wax for longer it sat. Uh, the wick actually was oversized by one size and I've had one that burned out. So you know, if you're going to, if you're going to test with high soy content candles, 
uh, with long cure times, um, I would do an early test and then a, a later one. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. I, every time I do either a new oil or a new wax, I always go the default one pound and the three eight, eight ounce jelly jars. That way I have three candles to test. Uh, and then I do that too. I'll do three different wicks in those. So if I know the wax and the oil combo, I'll put three different wicks in there. If I just want to test uh, like uh, wicking or like a new wax or something like that. Uh, but if I'm doing, uh, like you said, like a new batch, new box that comes in, uh, I'll make the three of them and then burn those at separate times. One, like 48 hours at one week and then at two weeks. Yep. Um, so I got a question from our organic lawn and DIY warrior asking how, how I came up with my candle company name. Um, well, just to save some time on here, I'll just, uh, I have a video on my channel, um, that I'll try to link to. Um, I, I think it's called like how I got started or origin story, something like that. Um, it's kind of a long story, so I, I'll just point you to that video. It's kind of an entertaining, funny video anyways. So, um, but check that out. Uh, it's, uh, it's, kind of hard to explain it in a quick answer but uh so yeah i'll defer you to that video for now <laughs> Some, uh, somebody said what's a good wick for a 16 ounce jar using 6006 wax and 464 wax having trouble getting a good melt pool uh that's a tough one if you can answer again what diameter what size uh that could be a few different wicks if you're using 6006 and 464 together again i still like the htp the cds work really well also uh, for a 16 ounce candle, yeah, again, we, I'd have to know the diameter to that one. That's a tough one to kind of throw out there. Yeah, because there's some 16 ounce candles that are just taller, but the same diameter. And there's also wide mouth ones. So if it's the wide yeah. mouth, we would really need to know that. You might end up having a double with that one. Yeah. If it's just the taller version of the smaller mason or smaller jelly jar, then, you know, I probably start with like an HTP 93 and then see how that goes and adjust from there. Because you're adding some 464, you might have to, yeah, I'm not as familiar mixing those two waxes together, but I would say 93 would be a good place to start. Yeah, I would say that too. The 93 or the 104, depend, again, depending on uh, how wide and the 16, like I have these right here. Um, I have some of these, and then I've also got the status jar, which is actually a little bit bigger. Uh, the 93 works perfect in this one. And then I got the tall 12 ounce uh, status jar, and that one, is bigger than this one. So I put the 104 in it and the 104 was so overwicked that I had to go back to, down to the 93 on that one. And I think it's just because it's so tall and once it starts to burn down, it really heats up on the inside. So you don't need to wick as big. Yep. Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a good point too for anyone that's, that's super new to testing. Make sure you test your candles all the way through. Uh, sometimes yeah. they'll look great towards the top and you feel like you got it dialed in. Before you know it, about two thirds down the jar, it's, it's burning way too hot. So um, I don't, I don't shoot for a, a quarter inch full melt pool in the first burn. I think generally if you do that, you're going to be over wicked. So um, that's just kind of the way I approach it. But just as long as you test all the way through and you know how your wax performs, that's the safest route to go. Yeah. I, think a lot I, of would, <clears throat> I would echo that. I know my first, uh, probably my first one or two burns, uh, I still like there to be a little bit of wax around the edge and not get a complete melt pool on that. Definitely not the first burn. Yep. Um, yeah. I like to see a full melt pool on like, like, I don't know if you're doing like a three, four hour burn test first, second, and then kind of middle way through the second, maybe closer to the third burn, getting that really nice full melt pool. Yep, exactly. And the exception to that would be your double and triple wick candles. Those, those are meant to get a faster melt pool just by the design of the candle. Same with your wood wicks. So I'll generally get, almost if not a full melt pool in the first one with wood wicks as well they just have wider flame profiles so it's it's not uncommon yeah uh, somebody said uh elena asked how do you feel about beeswax beeswax blends <clears throat> um i'm not a huge fan of beeswax and i will say i haven't used it enough to like really fall in love with it uh, i do like the smell of beeswax by itself i think it smells really nice uh, I've made a few candles with it. I used, gosh, I think I've only used the wooden wick, uh, the, their beeswax so far. I got a pretty good hot throw with it. It wasn't anything like crazy. I'm not dropping any other wax to go do it. Uh, but the, it hardens really hard. So you get cracks. Um, I don't know. It's, just, it's a little tougher for me to work with. Yeah, I don't, I'm not too fond of it. If anything, yeah. I'll use it to stabilize a few waxes. Um, if, if I'm looking for, if I'm going to make a pillar or if I've got some 
super soft wax that uh, I want to make some wax melts. Um, you can add some beeswax to it. That'll firm it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but other, other than that, I don't use that that much. Um, in fact, there's kind of a related question to that sort of to that point, not necessarily about beeswax from uh, from Jamie that says she was gifted two boxes of 444. Should she buy some coconut to mix with it to make it better? Um, and kind of what I just brought up with the beeswax, it depends if, if you make wax melts, Jamie, 444 does pretty good wax melts um, just because it's firmer than your 464. So if you make wax melts, you could use it for that. Um, but if you do want to use it for candles, um, I would suggest probably mix it with some coconut wax or even some 6006, something like that. I would definitely mix 444. You said, yeah, you said 444, right? Yep. Yeah, I would definitely mix it. I know for me personally, when I did some testing with that one, I wasn't a real fan of the way it uh, kind of hardened up. It's real cratered tops, looked like asphalt up on the top, get a little bit drier. But if you were to add some coconut oil or coconut wax, and then even like Wade said, 6006, you can definitely kind of clean up that uh, finished look of it a little bit. Um, I've, had, I've seen a couple questions so to try to consolidate this in the one question about using 6006 for melts. Um, I know people do it and some people have great success with it. Um, I'm not a fan of using it for wax melts. It's, it's just a little too soft and, and gooey for me. Um, it, it works fine. It performs great. It's more about the messy residue that's left either in the packaging or if you're using like clamshell packaging, I should say. Yeah. Um, it's terrible any other like melts. Yeah. Like if you're using like little shots, no yeah. shots. That's, that's yeah. different. Yep, exactly. Yeah, this is the only one I use 6006 straight is just in these shot cups. And I usually do these. Uh, if I go to a farmer's market, I'll have a bunch of these. People can just like buy one of them, take them home, try them out. But if I'm doing uh, 6006 in clamshells, I mix it with something else. Yeah, a good mix is mixing it with 4625. So yeah. anyone that's looking for to make some melts and you have some 6006, uh, 4625 is a hard pillar wax. It's a paraffin wax. Um, you don't need a ton of it. Um, you know, I think I think my favorite ratio was about 25 percent on that. It makes a really great throwing well wax yeah. melt and a great texture for wax melt. It well. looks nice, too. It does. Yeah. Uh, there's one from uh, Divya there, Jeff, if you want to maybe take the lead on that one. She said, as a small business owner, this is kind of a different type of question for this. Uh, what is your biggest challenge as a small business owner? Examples, time management, inventory, et cetera. Oh, for me, it's time management and that's in life in general. <laughs> I have so much I want to do. Uh, like tonight, I wanted to get a video done. I knew I was doing this. And then I also have a couple candles I need to finish up. So it's like, all right, which one? I don't need to do a video tonight. So I'll hold off on that one. Uh, I definitely wasn't missing the live. So I know I'm doing this one. And then once I get done with this one, it's like, all right, do I want to spend the next two hours like making candles? And then, of course, the next day, if I don't make candles, I'm like, God, I, I should have made candles last night. Definitely time management. Uh, and I still work full time uh, in IT. And then I do all this on the side. So time management for me is a big one. So I, I definitely, if I was going to fix anything, it would be that. Yep, I would 100% agree with Jeff. And I think anyone that gets into this uh, full time, <laughs> especially if you do anything else on the side, it's time management. Um I've got, I've got three little boys running around the house too. So I, I've got a lot of my hands. I'm actively involved in a lot of different things. And so I'm with Jeff. I, I use some project management applications to help me out, track everything I need to do on a kind of a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. This time of year is the worst because you're trying to tidy up inventory and get ready for taxes and all that. Right. And so this year's, this part of the year is really nuts, but a hundred percent agree that it's time management. And my, my advice is to keep things simple at, at, at first and uh, don't try to overwhelm yourself. It's a good way to get burnout, out and it, it'll happen to, to everyone. Um, it used yeah. to be inventory and materials and tracking and all that for me when I first started, because I, I dove right in and was ordering pallets from day one. It was a mess. Oh yeah. Um, but I, I use some software now. I did a video on it uh, on my channel uh, that uh, has really helped with that part of the process. It still takes a lot of time and work, but at least it's organized now. Um, but that's yeah. been my business lifeblood for a while, but it's time management. Yeah. Yeah, time management. And then after that one, especially in the beginning stages, I would definitely say, uh, it, I would echo Wade and say inventory management, figure out what you want to do. Uh, inventory management and money management is definitely a big one. I uh, don't go out and buy. Well, I mean, if you know you're going to do stuff and you know you've got the sales to, to get it, get the pallets. Uh, but if you're starting out in the beginning, I would say 
get your one or two jars that you're using. Definitely stick to that. Uh, don't go overboard with stuff that you want to do. And that's where my head gets big and my eyes get big thinking about all this stuff. And I did that in the beginning, probably the first year. I think I ordered like 10 different jars and then quickly realized what I'd taken on and ended up sticking with one or two. <laughs> yeah. 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 I definitely uh, over, over stretched myself for a good, good portion of time there. Oh yeah. Um, Somebody else just had one too. Uh, uh, Marta, have you come across a wax that you couldn't, or have you come across a wax that you couldn't wooden wick? Uh, I use a very soft rapeseed and coconut wax. Can't seem to find a wooden wick that would burn well. Eco and many other wicks work great. Yes, definitely. There are some waxes that wood wicks just will not work well with. Uh, they'll burn. Sometimes they go out. 4627, again, is one of them. Uh, I've had terrible luck with wood wicks and 4627. They just don't want to work together. Yeah, waxes that are too soft, wooden wicks act kind of strange. Um, mm -hmm. Crowblend 600, I have some wood wick candles in it, and they were great. And then other oils in that same wax, I can't, they're either over wicked or they drown out. So wood wicks, yeah. wood wicks in, in, in general are tough. They're, they can be very, very inconsistent. They're not engineered the same way that cotton wicks are. Um, and so that's why you can make a batch of wooden wick candles. You can make eight of them and four could burn great and four might not at all. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's tough to make wooden wicks and, and it goes for the big box companies too. Uh, a lot of you have probably bought some wooden wick candles from the store before and sometimes they don't stay lit. It's, it's something yeah. we all deal with. So. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Jacqueline asks, are there any ways to get certain fragrances to smell stronger? She has a couple fragrances and the ones she gives as examples are cinnamon, vanilla, hot buttered rum, and salted caramel that she gets very weak throw with, even if they're trying to use Vibar. Um, I know my, my immediate response to that is cinnamon vanillas are, so I, I use them as kind of baseline oil sometimes, but they're also can be very challenging to wick because they're very heavy oils. Yeah. And those those sometimes require a lot hotter flame to get those to get a good hot throw. But it, it really depends. We kind of probably need to know what wax you're using too, Jacqueline, and, and your jar. But uh, it That's usually awesome. comes down to wicking with those. If you're, if you're using a wax to throw as well, generally. Yeah, definitely. I would say the same thing. Uh, I, I'm not sure what oil percentage you're using, but definitely alter that a little bit. If you're using 10, go down to eight. Uh, if you're using eight, maybe try six, especially with the oils that you just mentioned. Like Wade said, those are very dense, very heavy oils. And then uh, I would definitely try the, the wicks also. If you're getting good hot throw from some other oils in your same wax oil combos, uh, if you're using like a CD or something like that, you might try like a CDN or an HTP just to see if it throws better uh, with that oil. You know, that brings up a good point too, that that I like to give as good advice to, to new candle makers is there are thousands of oils out there, fragrance oils. And so um, sometimes we get wrapped up in, in a certain oil that we bought. We try everything we can. We're doing, you know, jumping jacks and rain dances, trying to get oils to work well in certain waxes. And sometimes no matter what we do, it's just not in the cards. And, and the best solution instead of driving yourself nuts is scrap it and get a new one. Try another, another from another company try other oils. Don't, don't feel kind of tied to that one oil because yeah. it will drive you nuts. They don't all work great for everyone in all waxes. So definitely. Yeah. And trying oils from different companies is a great way to find out uh, what you like and what company you like. Uh, everybody's vanilla is going to be slightly different, even though it's a vanilla and you might find one from like nature's garden or something like that, that just smells so much better than uh, like someone else's. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's funny too, because the vanillas, man, there's so many variations that you think it's oh, vanilla. Yeah. Like vanilla is vanilla, vanilla. It, it's, it's not like I have some <laughs> vanillas that I love and then very vanilla makes me just want to chuck. It's just, it's so strong, but other people strong. Love it. I sell a ton of it and I don't like it. Yeah. So. And I like that one a lot too. And it's one of those ones where uh, if somebody wanted like a, a perfume type vanilla, very vanilla is not it. That's like a, somebody's cooking cookies or uh, like a cake or something. It's a cooking type vanilla. Yeah, it's almost, yeah, it's an Aztec sells like a birthday cake one. And I kind of like that vanilla a little bit better. It's more of a buttercream type vanilla. 
Yeah. Um, but, and then there's a, there's floral type vanillas, like you're saying that uh, nature's garden sells one. It's a French vanilla and Oak. And that's really interesting. And it's kind of that <laughs> floral and a little bit of sweetness. So there's lots of options out there. And so, yeah, that's kind of my advice on oils. If you're struggling with an oil, don't drive yourself crazy with it. There's lots out there to try. Yeah. Um, I just shot to the bottom. Let me scroll back up. <laughs> I like Christine Zeller's response about uh, how long do we need to cure before it gets to the can uh, to the customers? She says, well, these days, depending on if they use, <laughs> if they use USPS, they got a good solid three week cure yeah. time. <laughs> UPS is going to give you a two week cure just <laughs> on their own. That's funny. Yeah. I know they're killing me right now. It's so bad. I mean, it's everywhere. I guess they, I, there's articles out everywhere now where they've got packages, just floor to ceiling. Yep. Yeah. I, I saw, I saw, I don't know if it was a true story or if it was a meme, but I saw a postal worker showing up to work and she had to wait outside the door until they cleared packages out of the way so she could get in. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I'm getting, you say hi, pupper. <laughs> that's cute we're we're about to get a new a new puppy ourselves here in january at the charcoal lab we're pretty excited he's over here whining he wants me to play with him <laughs> i came straight home and walked straight on or jumped straight on the computer and he's like really come on <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> um so y yankee girl asked what is the best time of year to start a candle business uh she's in arizona well i would say um as soon as you can, uh, as soon as you can get yeah. started, I wouldn't so much worry on the business side when you're first getting started. I would let that those pieces fall in place a little bit later. But as far as getting started on learning candle making and doing testing and all of that, as soon as you can, the sooner you get started, the better, just like with almost anything. And then once you feel feel comfortable with it, I'm not sure it necessarily matters what time of the year you start a candle business. Um, I would I would uh, I'd probably recommend not having your first launch going right into the Christmas because it's the busiest time that it, it might yeah. overwhelm you. I would say probably start in spring or summer just to give yourself some time to get comfortable. I was going to say the same thing. And the, the, the reason I would say start in spring, uh, it, I'm not even sure what month, but yeah, definitely starting in spring. That way you can go through because uh, different people, it's going to take them different times to really perfect candle making. Some people jump right into it. And within two weeks, they're making a great candle. Some people go for three, four months before they find like their combos and everything. And uh, <clears throat> if you're doing that, if you were to start your candle business in like, like October, November, and you perfect everything by the time January comes around, uh, you're ready to launch basically right as candle season uh, kind of comes to a close and you're still going to get sales, but they're going to be a lot lower. So if you can launch closer to September coming up into fall and winter, the sales are going to be a lot better. Yep. Um, Don just, uh, just threw in a quick question. That's a pretty interesting one. And, and uh, there's a few people asking it and she asked if humidity affects waxes. Um, uh, yes. And it, it's a tough one. This is why when you see certain testing and results and, and uh, recommendations by people in candle groups don't work for other people, uh, on the opposite side of the country, for example, or in a different part of the world. And, um, it's because of humidity often and, or temperature. Humidity makes the air heavier and it's going to affect the way your candles absorb the oils and how much you need to stir or what temperatures you might need to add your oils in and how quickly or slowly your candles set up. So it's, it's really hard to have a, a general, here's your set rule to follow based off these temperatures and this humidity levels. My, my advice would be you kind of know your area. So test. And once you find that sweet spot, document it somewhere and then do your best to control that environment to match that humidity and temperature as much as you can. So if you're at home and you've got dehumidifiers and humidifiers, you can control that pretty well. But, uh, but yeah, it does, it does really vary by, by parts of the country and parts of the world for sure. Yeah. And that's one of those things I wish I could actually test a little bit better. We don't have much humidity here in the Seattle area, but uh, I know I'd lived in Georgia for a couple of years and I was in the military and the humidity there is just a nightmare. <laughs> It'd be nice to do some testing with that. But yeah, it, it can definitely play a difference. And like Wade said, just it's going to come down to testing. And you're yeah, going to be yeah. testing anyway, but. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just another factor you got to consider. And, yeah. and honestly, it's one of those things where it's, it's either better to be on one of the extremes, either not have humidity at all or have humidity. 
And then at least it, at least it makes it consistent environment. I'm in the Midwest, yeah. in Kansas City, where it could be humid as hell today and no humidity tomorrow. Yeah. And it's really tough. And so I have had to kind of, you know, with my workshops and stuff, I control the humidity and temperature as much as I can for consistency. But yeah, it can definitely affect it. Um, someone mentioned uh, temperature and, and how do you ship during the summer? Jeff, I know you've done video on that. I've talked about it, although I haven't really done a video on it. So um <laughs> You know, I'll let you go into more detail on that, but just real quickly, I, you know, I use waxes that generally hold up pretty well in the summer. And if I'm nervous at all in the middle of uh, the middle of the summer, um, the two things I do are I will add some gel packs from Uline if that helps, uh, if I'm overly concerned about it. Um, they're pretty cheap if you buy them in bulk. And then the other thing I do is I, I only ship Monday, Tuesday and Wednesdays during the summer so that they're never sitting in hot trucks over the weekend. But other than that, I'm curious what your advice is. Well, I was going to say the exact same thing. I got some of those, uh, I made the video on it. I got some of those uh, those uh, special kind of envelopes that you can pack them with. Those helped a little bit. Uh, gel packs. I haven't done too much with the gel packs, but uh, the, the main thing I do is during the summertime, I'll actually switch up the waxes a little bit or add a wax that holds up a little bit better. 6006 does pretty well, does, but yep. even, even adding a little bit of 4625 uh, just to harden that up a little bit. Uh, it's got a much higher melt point, so that'll help with the waxes a little bit. And then, like yeah, you said, shipping is going to be a big thing. If you can ship earlier in the week, that way they're not sitting in a truck for like three days. Yeah, big difference. Yeah, it, it does make a big difference, especially if you're in the, the brown microwave boxes like UPS. They just get real yeah. hot sitting there all weekend. But, you know, that's that's my only drawback, major drawback with the Pro Blend 600 is the melt point is down around 122 six out and six as you know is about 130 or so yeah so that, that's a big enough difference and i oh, haven't yeah. had i haven't really had a lot of problems with it but it's something to consider so um, i'm careful with those in the summer for sure yeah especially i don't if do outdoor events and craft fairs anymore yeah. very much but when i did sit and keeping those out in the heat they'll start sweating oh, yeah. Too, so. yeah they start sweating real quick if you're using a, a like a coconut wax or something like that those also have really low melt points yeah uh rebecca made a comment about Thank you, Rebecca. She was talking about my uh, health issue I had a while back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much. And then there's another one just above that. Oh, uh, have you guys had any trouble with HTP Wix having a dancing flame? Yeah, definitely. If you're having dancing flame, I would look at your oil percentage, and you could possibly have a wick that's just too big. Yep. Yeah, and I was going to touch on that, too. <laughs> um, well, actually, real quick, uh, scarf finger. Uh, Hoodrich said, uh, just wanted to say the most thankful, thank, uh, helpful thing that she's learned from me was using this foil pans with 6006. So what they're referring to that, if anyone hasn't seen that, um, there's a video of me making blue spruce candles in 6006 on my channel. And I revealed a kind of a tip that I use, especially if you're doing smaller batches with these foil pans. So I'll try to remember to link that, but, uh, but that, that will almost solve your sinkhole problem with 6006 and that video covers it in depth so you want to check that out but uh, to touch a little bit further on um on uh, jeff's point about uh yeah. actually now i lost my train of thought what were you talking about there jeff <laughs> oh yeah, I, yeah and, well, and the dancing the dancing flames of the yes, HCD wig. <laughs> yeah it's a uh, i find it less to to be less to do with the wicks than I do the wax and the oils. Um, like Jeff said, try changing your percentage uh, of, of fragrance oil. Um, but here's here's another thing that I think it's kind of a myth that wicks, wicks should be perfectly up and down centered and never flicker. That's kind of a myth. I mean, w candles are little bitty combustion engines and there's a lot going on in jars. Um, it's bringing oxygen in, it's burning, it's sending carbon dioxide out. There's a lot going on inside of a candle and that airflow that's happening is that's competing airflow in a jar. And that's why you'll see flickering happen even fur more further down in a jar. Honestly, I wouldn't let it worry you so much. In fact, a lot of people like the flickering. I mean, there's fake candles made to flicker on purpose. My only thing I would say is if your flickering is causing a lot of soot and smoke, that's something to correct. If it's just dancing a little bit, I wouldn't be concerned. Yeah, exactly. And especially if the flame is small too, and it's just kind of bouncing back and forth, perfectly acceptable, very normal. If it's like an inch tall and flicking around, definitely look into something. <laughs> Oil percentages and wick size for sure. 
Um, I've seen uh, Jacqueline, I think, asked a couple of times if anyone uses uh, 1285, IGI 1285, and I forgot the other one she mentioned. Personally, Jacqueline, I have not. I'm not sure if you have, Jeff. Uh, what was that again? Um, she was asking about IGI 1275 and 1285. I'm not. I, I haven't used one. But... No, I haven't used them yet. Yeah, so I'd hate to speculate and make up answers on that, Jacqueline. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, probably not too. Although now you just added two axes to the list. I want to test yeah exactly now i got some stuff to test out uh let me say other than the fact that it's been a crummy year do you notice a reduction in sales uh due to the fact the market is flooded so no that's the thing uh, i've done a lot of videos on this one and i'll let you answer the same thing uh yeah i haven't noticed a reduction in sales because of what's happening and i also don't see a reduction in sales because of like new candle makers on the market uh, I'm on the opposite side of that one. I honestly think there's so much opportunity out there that uh, one more candle maker coming into this space is not going to take a sale for me. Like if they sell one, it doesn't mean I don't sell one. Uh, so yeah, I, there's so much opportunity out there. And I mean, if you go look around, uh, what is it? Subway has 25,000 restaurants uh, and people are still opening up sandwich shops and making great money. So yeah, it's definitely not. I don't think it's flooded at all. No, and, and honestly, markets get saturated because there's a lot of demand. That's a good problem. Um, yeah. If you're in a market where you don't have a lot of competition, that's usually a red flag. And so I don't, I'm not afraid of the competition or saturation either. If Jeff and I were concerned about losing business, we wouldn't have YouTube channels, Facebook groups, and teach other people how to make candles. And we give away our secrets. We're not, we don't hold anything yeah. back. And I know some people do, but I'm not like that. I know Jeff's not like that. There's just so much to go around. Um, I, I have no concern with that either. Yeah. And I'll touch on what you just said about uh, like giving secrets away and stuff like that. I, most of the stuff that I do is real basic, real baseline stuff. I like, I'm not, uh, I'm not using any crazy proprietary, proprietary wax blends or anything like that. I, I think maybe if I came up with um, uh, that's why I always tell people to like try and like mix waxes and mix oils and stuff like that. Cause you're going to come up with like whatever your secret recipe is. Uh, it always kind of, I laugh when people uh, hold back their uh, their candle making techniques and all they're using is straight 464 and oils and like a CD wick. Like there's nothing to hide there. I don't know why people get so bent out of shape on that one. Uh, I do understand somebody creating like their own blend of wax. Like I have one uh, that I just started testing out and I'll probably say what it is because I'm still working through it. But yeah, like I blend 464, 6006, coconut soy, 4620. Like I blend all those just to see what's kind of going to work best. Uh, but if somebody was doing something like that, I can understand why they would maybe hide like the, the, the wax uh, ratios. Like if it's a 50, 25, 25, um, but yeah, for the most part, like it's not, yeah, there's nothing crazy going on here that I would need to hide anything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, speaking of secrets, I mean, I'll give you, I'll give one right now to my favorite wax melt recipe, period, in existence. I, I've never found one that I like this much as far as a wax blend. Now, I don't always use it because I don't always have these waxes on hand. And it can, the more waxes you add to a blend, the harder it is to kind of keep up with. Yeah. But um, there's three waxes. That if any, if, you, if all of you can get your hands on these, um, get yourself some 6006, which most people have or can get easily. Uh, get uh, 4627. Uh, I'm sorry, 4625, which is the pillar wax. Mm. <laughs> and uh, 464. If you mix, um, I, actually, actually, let me let me back up. It's a uh, 4625. 3022 wax, which is one I talked about earlier in this video, and then 464, oh, yeah. it creates this soft, um, and I'll put more details later to kind of highlight this recipe, but it creates this perfectly smooth, kind of soft, but not glossy where it leaves residue. It's almost like this kind of, uh, um, I don't know, kind of dryish, soft feel, yeah. and it pops right out of the, uh, out of the, the clamshells. Yeah. No mess, no residue, great pot throw. It's it's awesome. And it was just something I came up with on accident, messing around, just like you're talking about. Exactly. And that's and that's why I always tell people that's I mean, you came up with that because you were testing everything. And that's what I always tell people. It's like if you want to know what it's going to do, just, yeah, try it out, see what it's going to do, because you never know if you're going to stumble upon a wax or an oil combo that just makes you go, oh, yeah, I like that so much better. 
Yep. Um, I saw a question from Anthony um, about if there's any little tricks you can or anything you can add to candles uh, to keep them from sweating a little bit in the heat. Um, the only thing I, I have done is Vibar, um, and it depends on the candle wax that you're using. But uh, you'll probably want to use the Vibar 260, which is meant for container waxes. Um, the reason it helps with fragrance retention a little bit without to keep it from seeping out of your candle is uh, Vibar helps to evenly distribute all materials, candle dye, fragrance, other additives throughout the entire candle. And it allows the candle to hold just a little bit more fragrance oil. The other benefit, the reason it helps in shipping is it also raises the temp, uh, the melt point of your candle by a couple degrees. So nice. my bar would be the best advice I can give on that. Yeah, and I would say, I would say if you're getting sweating, um, I would, Definitely take a look at the oil percentage. I mean, sometimes during the summer, it, it, there's really not a whole lot you can get out of it or you can uh, do about it. Uh, when I was taking candles to farmer's markets, uh, even with the, the 6006, you're going to get a little bit of sweating doing that anyway. But if you're getting just normal shipping and you're seeing sweating, uh, you might also look at your oil percentage and see if you need to just drop it down just a little bit. Yep. Yeah, there's a difference between fragrance uh, escaping or sweating because of heat versus yeah. uh, uh, too much load. Um, usually, <laughs> if, it's, if your candle's sweating in the heat, that's just because the candle's starting to melt. It's not so much that their oil's <laughs> escaping. That's, that is quite different, though, than if your candle's just sitting on a shelf at room temperature and oil starts seeping out of the top, that's usually a sign of a problem. Which do you guys think is best, cotton wicks or wooden wicks? Um, there's a few different ways to answer that one. It, uh, consistency, definitely cotton. Um, you're not get, like Wade was saying earlier with the wooden wicks, you can make eight candles and you can have three or four that don't burn the same way that, uh, the other five or uh, four or five are burning. Uh, I love wooden wicks. I like the way they look. I like the way they sound. Um, but if I was going to have to pick one of those two, I would go cotton just because it's, yeah, it, it's almost a surefire bet that you're going <laughs> to win with those. Yeah, uh, my answer is very similar. Um, I use wood wicks, wooden wicks for one reason and one reason only, <clears throat> and it's to fill that jar size that's that's in between cotton sizes for me. So uh, yeah. my standard jar, like my nine ounce straight set of jars. Uh, one sec here. <laughs> so like something like this size right here, almost like a jelly jar size. A single wick, cotton wick, that's what I'm going to use. I'm not going to use wood wicks or something like this. Um, yeah. And then larger jars, like four inches and bigger, I'll use double wick or triple wick with cotton wicks. And then what I do with the wood wicks is the size that's in between, like, like your tumblers that are about three to three and a half yeah. inches. The reason is, is it's very hard to single wick these with cotton wicks, especially with certain waxes. Um, and they're almost too small to double wick. So that's when I find wooden wicks to be like perfect. Exactly. I've got those aura jars and uh, let me see, I've got one right here. Yeah, this one right here. <laughs> yeah, this is right around that three inch to 3.25. It's such a, like Wade was saying, it's really tough. You almost have to double wick it, but these wooden wicks fit perfect just because you get that wide flame throw. And uh, yeah, it turns out great with those. But I agree with you. I like the the ease of the consistency of the cotton wicks. Uh, Denisha, uh, we were talking about Vibar there for a second. She asked what wax you can use Vibar in. Really any wax that doesn't already have Vibar in it. Um, and I know that's kind of an <laughs> ambiguous answer, but uh, if you don't, if you're not sure if your wax has Vibar in it, just ask the supplier. Um, most like IGI 6006 already has Vibar. It's part of its blend. So you don't want to add it to that. Um, but most of your straight soil waxes, like your 464, even your ProBlend 600 and your Joy Wax do not have Vibar. So you can add it to those. It's the, it's the type of Vibar that you, you're going to use, though, that you want to do a little research on. Um, there's three Vibars out there. And uh, depending on the type of wax and what, your, what the purpose is, um, you'll want to use a different Vibar. Um, I do have a Vibar video. It goes all into detail if you guys want to check that out. I need to get some of that. I have still never used Vibar. I need to get some yeah. for testing. It definitely has its time and place for sure. I don't use it yeah. in all my products though. Someone asked if you've ever used the Millennium Soy Wax from American Soy Organics. I saw um, that. And how we like that. Jeff, I don't know if you've used it. Um, 
I haven't used the Millennium Soy Wax, but what I was, my understanding, I could be wrong on this, it don't hold me to it, but I believe I had read that that is the same wax that's manufactured for the companies who make the ProBlend 600 and the Joy Wax. I'm oh, pretty sure okay. it's a very similar wax. It's just, okay. that wax is pretty popular. It just gets rebranded depending on what supplier is selling it. But that's that's the best answer I can give on that. Yeah, I haven't used it yet. I've seen the Millennium uh, pop up in uh, one of the forums recently, and I was going to try to grab some to see what uh, to see how well it performs. So Ar Ariana's in here now. Ariana, we were talking about you earlier. We have hey, there people, she is. Yeah, we have some people asking about uh, the Eco Soil waxes, and we directed them to you and your channel, um, or just to reach out to you because we know that you use that wax and like it a lot. So. Yeah. Hold on a second. I'll see if she. Um, so Caleb, you asked if we had found a replacement for HTP wicks. I know you just got on, but we did talk about that a little earlier. Um, good news is it's H the new HTP wicks are going to be coming out. So just give it a little bit more time. You're not really going to find a replacement for them. You would have to retest. There's not going to be some kind of apples to apples replacement for them um, or alternative, but uh, I would say um, good news. They're supposed to be coming out again. Um, when I make waxes or make candles, Jeff, I don't know if you do the same thing, but I like to try to find two or three wick wicks that work well so that I always have a backup plan. Two or three wicks? Yeah, I'll have my kind of go-to wick and then oh, yeah. a backup one. So Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, it, this situation right now with the HTP wicks, uh, if I didn't have a big stock of those, I'd be scrambling right now to try and figure out a new wick to kind of uh, – <laughs> Hold the yeah be in the interim between the the old and the new ones coming back in, but yeah, I definitely try to at least keep like a CD that I know will work in the same jar. Uh, Jessica asks if it's bad or good idea to double wick a three inch diameter jar. That's right on that line. I would say for the most most of the time, I would not recommend it. It's really really small, but uh, for two wicks, but it does depend on the wax you use. Um, you know it. It's, it's just hard to answer that. Uh, there's a time to, to do it for sure, but those are the ones that I use the wooden wicks in personally. What was that? I missed that one. What was the question again? If it's good or bad idea to try to double wick a three inch diameter jar. I know people do it. I don't, it's really close. Yeah, that's one of those tough ones where like Wade was saying, three inch to 3.25 is right at that point where it should be a single, but it's almost a double. Uh, wood wicks definitely cross that gap really well. Uh, if you are going to double wick a three inch, I would definitely start very small with your wicks and go up from there. Uh, I'm even like in this aura jar, I think it's like a 3.25. Like I would probably be doing it, like an HDP, uh, like a 62, like two 62s, maybe the 50, uh, 50, is it 53 or 52 in those? Uh, 52s, yep. Uh, yeah, so probably the HTP 52 or 62 start low and go up from there because they can get overwicked really fast. Yep, the hotter, the the higher their melt point, um, and the slower or the the lower the candle temperature is when it burns. So like high melt point soy waxes would be a good example of ones that you can double wick in those and not have much of a problem. I wouldn't do it with a paraffin; it's just going to end up burning too hot, I think. Um, her follow up to that was, well, is it a good idea to do it if it's just a hobby? Well, if it's just a hobby, you can really kind of do anything you want. Um, but I tend to treat a hobby almost like a business in the sense that you never know if your hobby is going to turn into a business or if you're going to have friends and family that just start wanting your candles because they know you make them. So I would still err on the side of caution and make them as if you're going to potentially sell them to others. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely take the time, effort and yeah, everything to put into them. Any others there that you're you're seeing you want to grab? I just kind of been bouncing around there. Yeah, I'm scrolling down through the bottom of them now. Before, I think I was kind of rolling off for, yeah. for, for the bottom. So. Before this dog like drags me by the <laughs> by the shoe to take him out. <laughs> uh, what do we have? You know, Z uh, Zena, we touched on this a little bit, but Zena Moore asked, "What wicks should you use for 6006?" Um, as Jeff and I were talking about earlier. There's too many other factors to answer that really directly. We kind of need to know your jar, um, your jar diameter size. But for the most part, Jeff and I both like HTP wicks in 6006. I've also had good luck with Premier 700 wicks and Zinc Core wicks. Yeah, Some the people Premier, go, sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, I was going to, no, I was going to echo the premiere. That, yeah. Those are really nice. Yeah. I, I like them. They don't lean as much as the HTPs, which, which is nice. Um, although I still think HTP, I probably lean toward them for 6,006 over the others. Uh, they're pretty consistent, which is nice, yeah. but um, you can also use CD and Eco. Um, I'm not a fan of either of those in HTP Wix, but I know people use them for me. They burn a little too hot and the flames get a little too wild and smoky for me, but you can use them if you, if you want to try them out. Yeah, I've had decent luck with some CDs uh, in different waxes also. The Ecos, I've never been a huge fan of. I need to test them a little bit more, but uh, yeah, other Wix have worked so much better that I just kind of stuck with those. Yeah, I, I only like the Ecos and CDs in the... Uh, Oop, hit my camera there. I only like the Ecos and CDs in, in soy waxes, like 464 or, or heavy soy balloons. Let's see. Poppers. What are you doing? <laughs> Let me scroll back up and see if I've missed any. Yeah, I'm sure. Sure, we missed I know there's any. several in here, yeah. It's nice because a lot of these questions that some of you are putting in here, some other people are jumping in and giving some good answers. Ariane has the Millennium and the Freedom Wax. Uh, <laughs> <I'll be. laughs> so uh, couple, a couple nice just feedback comments. Uh, so I appreciate all of you with all your, your kind comments. You know, Marta said, thank you so much. You guys are doing do a great job together. Um, yeah, I mean... I think Jeff and I have been kind of knowing each other now for a little while in the candle industry and been trying to do this for a little while, but yeah. you know how things are. schedules are nuts. And, and uh, you know, Jeff's over there on the uh, West coast and I'm here in the Midwest. So that's two hour difference <laughs> that can make things challenging sometimes as well. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, Thank you all you guys. So Elena said, what are your favorite fragrances? I know Jeff does not like patchouli. <laughs> Let's be honest, not many people love patchouli. Yeah, it's, well, and around here, it's such a big seller that I have to make it. That and Nag Champa, I mean, <laughs> if I don't have Nag Champa, 20 people will ask me for it at a farmer's market. And it's like, all right. I. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you know, we, we make what sells, not necessarily our favorites, you know. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. sticking up, all right. My girlfriend's in here now. She's sticking up for Ollie. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I don't know if I personally have a favorite. Um, I I don't like bakery scents as much. Um, it's just too much too much sweetness going on for bakery scents for me. I prefer um, the woodsy ones, outdoor ones. You know, your birches and your firs and your pines and things like that. Um, That's just what I like. And you know, I live out in the country on this property, and I just like that kind of natural smell. But Again, I don't make what I like. I make what sells and what other customers yeah. like. You know, strangely, for 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 three years straight, my number one selling fragrance was hazelnut coffee. I don't know why. Oh, really? But three years straight. Now it's it's been replaced by several by now, but uh, it just comes in waves. It's it's really interesting that uh, kind of what sticks for a while and, and why. Yeah. I, my favorite is definitely cinnamon. It's always been my favorite. It's a very basic one, but and it was, that's why I'm glad I make candles now because most companies, when I didn't make candles and I was buying, or my, uh, my ex was buying them, it was, uh, it was always mixed with something. It was like an apple cinnamon or a cinnamon cranberry or something. And I could never find a straight cinnamon, but yeah, definitely one of my favorites. Uh, I love a lot of the food type ones. Uh, banana nut bread is also a really nice one. Yeah, that's one of the ones I like the best. Yeah, that one's really nice. Uh, sea salt and orchid, I love. Yeah, hey, you know, I I sell a ton of bakery. I would say they probably sell just as good as everything else. Uh, oh yeah, just, I can only smell too much of food food cooking before yeah. I want to just go eat. So <laughs> I know. Plumeria is another nice one. Uh, I'm not. Well, I, I'm actually a big fan of florals. A lot of people don't like them. They get real perfumey. There's definitely some ones that I won't do. Uh, I love the smell of rose, but I'm not going to burn it. Uh, Plumeria is a really nice one. Uh, certain lavenders are really nice. You know, you were talking about cinnamon there, Jeff. I, uh, um, I'm with you. I liked a lot of cranberry cinnamons, apple cinnamons. And so I was kind of on a hunt and I never really found a, a complete pure cinnamon that I like, but I found some that are mostly cinnamon. Um, I, I don't even mind red hot cinnamon or whatever it is oh, from candle sign. I like yeah. that a lot, but 
harvest if you haven't tried harvest type from nature's garden it's mostly no. cinnamon with a little bit of clove it's really the best oh. i'll yeah, definitely have to get that i know uh actually one of my favorite scents and candle science discontinued it and i need to get it and i found a company that has it but i've got to order it in like five pound uh barrels <laughs> is the uh um the spice market that candle science used to have Yep. That that was easily one of my favorites. Definitely a uh, huge seller too. Yeah. And th that's the one they discontinued about a year or so ago, a couple years I, ago. I think it's been a couple years now. Yeah. And I emailed them that one. Yeah. And, that. Yeah. 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 That was, that was easily my biggest seller for the first couple of years. I was really disappointed that they, they lost it. And I think other companies probably have it. I just don't know what they call it. Yeah. They all, Name it something, something yeah. a little bit different. Yeah. <clears throat> but that one was like a really good, well-rounded uh, fall, winter type scent because it had like cinnamon, it had clove, had a little bit of orange, I think, in it. But it, yeah, really nice. You know, you mentioned patchouli uh, as kind of a joke, but anyone else in here that that kind of doesn't really like patchouli but wants to sell some type of patchouli, um, Aztec Candle Supply has or CandleMaking.com is their website. Um, hit or miss, I'll be honest, in, in my opinion, but they've got one called Peaceful Patchouli, and it's just kind of this light patchouli, and it, oh, I don't really? know what else it's mixed with, but I actually like that one, so anyone curious on a patchouli, yeah. want to try that one out. I, I do like uh, Dragon's Blood, which has patchouli in it, but it's yes. it's so faint in there that it's good, but Dragon's yeah. Blood, I do like. That's one of those fragrances I was talking about earlier that I got to use 6% on. It's so strong. Yeah, that one is definitely strong. <laughs> Um, Divya or Divya, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, yeah. Asked if we warm our jars before we pour. Um, it depends for me. Um, I don't know what your process is on that. I never do. Yeah, I mean, the only thing for me, it comes down to time. I don't want to spend 20, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, heating up jars and then taking them out, transferring them from like a baking tray to the table uh, when all it's going to do is potentially help wet spots that are still going to happen when you send them out in cold temperatures. Yeah. Yep. I'm not going to waste. Yeah. I'm not going to waste that extra time when it's something that could still happen. Yeah. Uh, pretty much similar answer. Uh, when I started candle making, I tried it as a little quick fix to issues that, you know, some people deal with early on, but my general advice um, when I'm talking about candle making processes is I don't like to do anything that's not scalable. If I'm going to have a hard time scaling this to larger batches, then I'm not adding that because it's it's just I, I, I want it to be re repetitive or, or be able to be repeated. Um, yeah. And I'm willing to bet anybody making 100 candles is not heating their jars. No, there's just no way to keep up with that. No. It's like too much. <laughs> yeah. It's, but I know why people do it. And I know that it helps. So my advice would be what someone commented on a tip that I gave in one of my videos about these baking trays. Yes. That kind of eliminates the need for heating your candles. Um, so uh, yeah, that would be my advice. And, and uh, it's just these aluminum baking pans. It's in my 6,006. Actually, I use them in a lot of the videos on my channel I've posted recently, but uh, that'll hey. keep your jars warm. And, and you can also pour them in the box they came in. Yeah, I was just going to say this one right here. So this, this is one way 6006. Uh, when you're pouring your jars, pour your jar and then put them right back into the box and let them cool in the box and it cools them slower uh, and you'll get far less sinkholes and better glass adhesion. Now for me with 6006, if when I do this and I've done it for testing, I still run a chopstick through or, <laughs> or a skewer to make sure there's no sinkholes anyways. And a lot of times I've found even doing it with this method, you get better glass adhesion, but there's still little uh, small sinkholes in the middle of it. So definitely kind of be aware of that. But yeah, yes. cool in the box like that is a great way to kind of let them cool slower and get better glass adhesion. Exactly. And, and, it, and it does help with the sinkholes too, although there still yeah. could be some, but it does, it mitigates them a little bit, but that's a really good piece of advice that um, just wanted to reiterate that Jeff just brought up get some uh, wooden skewers or something. And I do this on almost all candles um, yeah. is poke, poke little relief holes around the wick, um, you know, six or eight little holes with a skewer or whatever you have and do that about, you know, I don't wait till it's fully hard to do that, but until it's almost solidified, you know, you, a little soft still, just get your heat gun or whatever and fill it back in. That will solve your heat, your sinkhole problem because 
otherwise you don't always know that sinkholes exist and then your yeah. candles could uh, drown out later and you'll get customer complaints about it occasionally. You're like, I don't understand. They look fine when I sent them out. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it's, uh, I just started pouring the, uh, the little kind of tapered uh, tumblers and those cool. They don't look like they have any sinkholes across the top. They look perfect. And I thought I found a 6,006 vessel that I wouldn't have to do it with. Uh, but of course, like Wade was saying, I run a skewer through every single candle when I do 6,006 and every single one of those, once I got the chopstick, like halfway down, it dropped and you could feel the sinkhole in the middle of the candle. Yeah. You can so feel definitely, it. Definitely. Yeah. You, you, you would have never seen it. And I almost like, I, I mean, I wasn't going to, but I was real tempted to go, all right, these are perfect right out of the box. I don't have to do anything. And then of course I tested them all and every single one had that little gap right in the middle. Yep. And, and you'll get sinkholes more on jars that are taller than they are wide. Definitely. So short squatty jars, you won't have near as many issues. No, I've never, like the big uh, tins or anything like that, the the shorter kind of uh, fatter ones. I've, yeah, never a sinkhole in those at all. No. I think this dog is going <laughs> to, we'll wrap it up here in a minute. He's ready yeah. to. He's ready to yeah, play in the outside. I was going to ask you on that. I didn't want the meeting to just cut us off in the middle of talking or something. So I don't know how much longer we had left. But No, we'll go ahead and, uh, yeah, I, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I'm done, Papa. <laughs> well, I just, I just want to say real quick that appreciate everyone coming by and, and being patient while we put this together. Um, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Jeff, but, you know, I, I would definitely like to do some more of these in the future. So Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Jeff wants to do it we can kind of make it a semi-regular thing. It'd be great. Cause there's a lot of, there's some questions we didn't get to. And I know there'll be a lot of people that weren't here on this one that will be on future ones. So. Yeah. And I'll definitely try to go through and I think we will do the same. I'll try to go through uh, my channel and his channel and try to answer a lot of the questions that I uh, didn't get touched on, but yeah, I definitely want to jump back in here. We'll do a live again and uh, yeah, we'll start answering a bunch more questions. Sounds good. Yeah, that's perfect. And thank you for jumping on. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll schedule the next one. Yep. Thank you as well. And hopefully you can go get some other stuff down, done now that I know you rushed home just to get this going. So I appreciate that. And again, thanks everyone. And we'll. Uh, yeah. Thank you everyone for showing up. To make this a regular thing. So. <laughs>